the main themes I want to be touching on today is how do we bring mobility into an understanding of resilience? How do we bring it into understanding of transition and sustainability? Um, and I want to talk about displacement effects and why they're important and then deal with um, some research I've currently been doing, looking at what, what I call voluntary temporary populations, uh, which obviously includes tourists, but more than that, and then make some comments about, about the future. I think using the word transition is always a really interesting one. And it's used a lot, whether we're talking about sustain, sustainability or in terms of regional development, because transitions are always happening. Change is normal. Processes are always ongoing. But I think what may well be important, particularly at the moment, is the significance of, of individual crisis events. And in fact, if I was going to be summing up resilience theory, one of the issues you have with it is how does resilience thinking treat normal change? Because at least in tourism and in a lot of areas, it's usually a hallmark in response to a specific crisis event or a disaster. And I think that is a, a real challenge in the value of the, of the concept. But I think what is significant when we're looking at change and particularly the impacts of COVID-19 is that you're getting very substantial debates at the moment about um, tourism and resilience, tourism and sustainability, and some scholars who are focusing really substantially on transformation and the possibility of transformation uh, because of the effects of COVID-19. I actually think, and I'll, I'll say this at the outset, that a lot of the discussion we're seeing about COVID-19 and transformation, particularly in terms of environmental and sustainable futures, I think is tremendously optimistic. I hate to say that because I wish I was more optimistic, but I, I, that's how I see it. But nevertheless, there is that interest in transformation. So just thinking about some background and issues in this material. Clearly, COVID-19 is actually not the first pandemic tourism has experienced. As I've got on the PowerPoint, um, I think you will end up being the most researched. And I'm being slightly cynical because there's actually been very few people who have consistently paid attention to the implications of pandemics for tourism and on the implications of what that means in terms of tourist mobilities. Even though it has clearly been important um, since the, the age of modern tourism. And we can, we can go to the 1958 flu, we can go to the, the late 1960s and another flu there. There's been a whole series of, of pandemics and crises that have affected tourism. I know I did, I did a paper oh, about 10 years or so ago now, which looked at crisis in tourism. And it, one of the things I found most interesting in that is often the lack of capacity in tourism research to distinguish between normal economic and business cycles and between a crisis. And also there was seemed to be very limited capacity for either organizational or policy learning from previous crises. And in one sense, I do wonder whether we see that here. I know that for many of you in terms of your own research, I think that's one of the points I find really interesting is being able to go back and look at previous analog events that, and responses to them that may shed light on current situations. Resilience has also been given lots of focus in recent years, not just in tourism, but in other, other areas. 
And sometimes we find in the social sciences that you have concepts that become um, fashionable. And I think resilience has some of that to it. Um, it is a boundary spanning concept, so it's appealing that way. But that also means because it is a boundary spanning concept, it also creates problems because it means there's different understandings of it. Um, for me, when I'm thinking about resilience, I'm very much coming from um, a socio-ecological perspective. I'm also, and obviously coming from a geography perspective and someone with a background in systems analysis, very, very interested in how we mesh our understanding of resilience in with um, different scales of analysis. And I think that creates really substantial issues in terms of method. And also as part of that, um, I'm interested in the, in the connectivity. How do we tie the various scales together? Um, I mean, to me, it's very much a structure agency issue, but it's also something which clearly in, in you know, regional studies we're always interested in, is that how do we collect individual and organizational actions with what happens in, at the local, then what happens at the regional, what happens at national and at the global, and how does that work up and down? And I think that's a, a major issue that we have in trying to operationalize the concept of resilience from just being um, a learning tool. For me, one of the ways, obviously, we think about it and drawing on the resilience literature um, from a socio-ecological kind of perspective, you know, we think of the, the concept, concept of panarchy or panarchy, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and here I've got one which, a panarchic model I, I developed several years ago, which looked at that connection. In fact, I think I used a hotel. Looks at that connection between you know an individual room, and in terms of the scaling up, and think about how how change occurs, and what's the relationship up and down. I mean, and this is one of the real struggles that I think we have into connecting resilience to COVID nineteen or a similar type of crisis event, in that how will change work up and down different levels of a system? How do we imagine that? Um, and how do we come to understand that beyond a mere qualitative understanding? Now, I'm not knocking the qualitative understanding in the slightest. I think that's absolutely critical. But at the same time, are we able to show um, numerically, because a lot of the world thinks numerically, in terms of those interrelationships up and down the system? And how do we connect what happens at a, a very small, narrow space, or an individual, it could be either, how do we then connect back up and down? I mean, this is clearly not just an issue of resilience, it really is the classic structure agency debate but to me it's one of those things that is absolutely fundamental to trying to understand resilience and trans transition and sustainability how do we how do we imagine that how do we conceptualize it and how do we communicate it um particularly that we're dealing with extended time scales um and we want to connect what's happening in the immediate as to what may happen in the future on obviously back in the past. And that, that multi-scalar thinking, I think is one of the really big challenges that we have in to make, to make resilience thinking absolutely, actually work. And in some ways, those kind of issues tie back into sustainability. Sustainability is also a boundary spanning concept. It's one that so many people and interests can buy into, almost too many, you could argue, because if you're not careful, it means so many things, it, it, loses, it loses sense at times. And I think you almost have this was connecting tourism and sustainability. 
And as I've got there in the PowerPoint, I think the, a key issue is a fundamental question there is the sustainability of what? And it, it's a, an old debate, but very important one. There's a difference between the sustainability of tourism versus tourism's contribution to sustainability. And I, and I think in terms of dealing with regions and the tour, tourism itself, this becomes a very important part of positionality. And I think it's one of the things I find really interesting in terms, again, of the response to COVID-19, because it may also mean that for a sustainable, a sustainable region or destination, having much fewer tourists could potentially be much better with respect to the sustainability of that location. And so just having continued tourism numbers may not be the best. But that's a scalar question. Dealing with scale, different, dealing with positionality and how that becomes connected. And I think it's a very important debate though, in terms of what happens with terms of regions and what happens with transformation, if any, of tourism. And if you're posing those questions, and obviously you're asking the issue of well, what would a future trajectory of a region of a destination? We have a scale of this year, and I've, this is one of those diagrams I use to help explain help explain problems of over tourism to really try and convey the issue of scale, because you have a situation. In which if you have a particular location in which you've got too many tourists, the current solution is to spread them out. But how, for how much longer can you just keep spreading out? Because you then reach a point, you've only got one planet. How then do we deal with that? And that really is from a sustainability issue that how do we connect what happens at the local scale with what happens at the bigger scale? Because clearly that, gr that growth means you're cutting in to natural capital. How, how do we respond to that? And so if we are thinking about sustain sustainability and change, how do we respond? In terms of thinking about the trajectory for regions, what direction do they go and what nudges the trajectory? If I'm thinking about what's happening at the moment, obviously you've got existing trajectories for regions. So then what is the organizational change and what is the individual change in response to that crisis event, which is going to shift trajectories or not? And I pose that or not, um, question very, very significantly. Because if we look at the natural hazards research over many years and disaster research, one of the things that we should recognize is that a crisis event may actually lead to the intensification of existing trajectories. And obviously, if we're then placing that into a context of sustainability, and issues of environmental change and global heating, that could well be frightening in terms of its possibility. But if we look at some countries, hate to do it, but look at the United States or Brazil, then clearly you have that occurring in terms of an intensification of particular tra trajectories that were there before COVID-19, but have now become worse. And they are worse in terms of the environment and I give even terms of broader population. So what direction will the trajectory go and why? Will it move towards something that's more transformational with, with respect to a focus on sustainability? Or will it be, I've got here my optimistic business as usual trajectory, which is adoption more of a green growth approach, which has its own problems actually in terms of how viable that is in terms of long-term sustainability. Because 
if we're looking at different paradigms, that eco-efficiency type approach versus a sustainable consumption type approach doesn't take in um, issues of rebound effects. And fundamentally, it's just making um, existing consumption per capita or per item of consumption more efficient. Doesn't take into account continuing growth. So how then do we do that? And then we have issues in terms of how do we transition? How do we transition? We have a lock-in. If we're not careful, it may be a lock-in that we don't want. So what will be the factors and how will we track them in terms of COVID-19 and the impact that it makes and how COVID-19 effects reverberate through the tourist tourism system and through the wider socio-economic system. When there are a number of different um, policy avenues that one could go down, but the more radical um, considerations, which may, may be more of a degrowth approach, certainly uh, are not in favour at the national governmental levels. And so we're fund fundamentally posing the question then, in terms of overall sustainability, what difference does then a crisis or a disaster really make? And so what I want then to look at in thinking about that is looking at displacement effects. And this is more of a short-term thing, but it can obviously lead to longer-term implications. When there is a disaster, or a response to a crisis. How does that affect consumption? Obviously, we're interested in tourist consumption. And how does that then link to um, where visitors go and what they consume? Because that then has obviously has flow on um, implications for businesses and for regions, organizations, a whole range of different things. And I think one of the points I, I want to stress, and this is an, an important one in terms of policy learning. Um, Clearly, different types of crises and disasters, they have different implications for consumption because they have different impacts on people, supply chains, infrastructure, and governance. And they're also a different in other ways because different types of disasters and crisis um, mean that the notions of risk is also differentially socially constructed. I know there's probably too many differences in there, but hopefully you get the point in that, that real importance of focusing on particular crises and disasters to see what the flow on effects will be, because not all the same. What's the, limit, the level of similarity and difference between them? I think in the case of COVID-19, one of the things I find fascinating and I'm looking at some of the literature that's already coming out and some of the publications already come out, as well as government responses, is that I think at times there's not enough recognition of the different ways in which risk is being constructed, which is obviously critical for tourism because perceptions of risk, clearly for um, leisure travelers in particular, um, will affect their mobility how they travel, where they travel, how long they travel for, which then has um, subsequent economic impacts. And so I think there's, there's therefore potentially differences in thinking about the impact of an earthquake or a hurricane versus the impact of non-pharmaceutical um, interventions, which we see um, with COVID-19, um, distancing, restrictions on mobility, lockdown, border controls, that kind of thing. And because that leads to actually different types of consumption displacement. And if we're looking at the, um, the regional development dynamics, that consumption displacement actually becomes very, very significant. And one of the things I find in much of the discussion about tourism is that there's not enough attention being given to context of particular 
countries and location. And it's not just a case in terms of how tourism dependent they are, because what the equation should be looking at is, well, what's the relative balance between inbound tourism and outbound tourism? There's a heck of a lot of mobility out there. So if you can't travel so much, what happens with the, the, the outbound travel that was occurring? Where do they go? Well, they, they're going to be at home. And in, in many cases, and in fact, New Zealand's a little bit like this. In many cases, there's not that much difference between the two. And in some cases, you could argue that economically, from a broader perspective, um, some, some countries may even benefit because their own nationals are not traveling. But that has been missing from a lot of the discussions we've had in the media and a little bit in academia, I guess, with respect to the, the effects of COVID-19. Because we're interested in how COVID-19 displaces mobilities. And I mean, and what you have here on, the, on this slide is just one particular way of trying to conceptualize the different transformations that take place in consumption. So it's where does consumption occur? When does it occur? And it's actually the when that's most given attention I think, in terms of crises, in buying. But okay, there's other aspects as well. So we have the word, but it's also what and why consumption occurs. And one of the things that becomes significant when you think about that is that clearly because of some of the, the constraints that exist, there is potential for relocalization, which may be you know, quite significant in terms of local economies. And obviously there's interest in how consumption occurs and particularly offline versus online. So, I mean, they're the kinds of questions we therefore need to be asking if we're really trying to do a good analysis of what the implications of COVID-19 are on regions and on tourism, but it's wider than that. And also they need to be placed within a temporal context. And I think that temporal context is absolutely critical to really trying to understand the, the effects of crises and disasters and transition. Um, and I think here, um, you know, I'd be advocating the use of more of a life course approach to disasters and look at how consumer perceptions, tourist perceptions and environmental conditions change over time and to see if there are new practices that develop. I mean, one of the things that interests me most in my own research is in terms of sustainability is trying to understand how do we change social practices? In other words, how do we change bad habits? Because so much of our consumption is habitual. How do we do that? Um, in social marketing, which I'm also obviously very interested in behavior interventions, they only lie at quite a superficial level. So how then do we use structures, uh, what you might also call upstream social marketing, changing structures, changing institutions to change practices. In one sense, you've got um, a sort of a natural experiment happening at the moment in some locations with that. But will some of the new travel patterns that you may have in the short term, how long will they be sustained unless the constraints are there for quite a long time? Because so I'm not sure they will be the new practices will necessarily develop. I know there's lots of noise about it at the moment, about there being a new beginning, but I am, I am not sure. I am not sure at all as to whether those practices are going to be turned into long-term sustained practices. And I think that's a change for research as well, in that if you take advocating a temporal approach, how do we take a longitudinal analysis of that? And how do we look at that? Clearly, how we normally conceptualize disasters in stages, so that is implicit in that kind of, of thinking. But in terms of trying to understand it and recovery trajectories, we need to bring time into that, combine it with those displacement effects to really try and understand um, some of the shifts that are occurring, some of the changes that are occurring or not, um, and its implications for regions and community well-being. And I think from a tourism perspective, 
as well as other sectors, you know, it's, it's so important here to bear in mind that different sectors have different markets, which will recover differentially. I, I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but I'm amazed how that's not being picked up enough. Um, one of the things that having lived through the earthquakes we had here in Christchurch that we um, experienced in 2010, 2011, um, and a little bit afterwards as well, I'd add, um, is the effect it has. I mean, and here, if you actually want to, to continue to attract numbers of tourists to do so, to be honest, isn't rocket science. Um, fundamentally, your domestic tourists should be fundamental to any restart and recovery and even and particular types of tourists as well vfr visiting friends and relations um tourists are, are really important here uh because they have familial relations they have place attachments um they have events such as weddings or unfortunately in this time funerals to go to all of which drive mobility and travel and um, they're the kind of things because of social obligations people will go and do. And VFR arguably is the market that is, should be first off the rank in terms of trying to recover. And we know from the experience we had in terms of the Christchurch um, earthquake sequence that, I mean, the, the domestic market, and you can see there from the green line, was far less impacted relatively than the international market. And, and that, even though it's an earthquake, that's still something which you, one of the few things you can also transition over into thinking about COVID-19. But it also raises, I think, bigger questions in terms of thinking about resilience and destinations and regions and place. Um, because in my, the research that's done on regions and resilience is premised on that idea of a permanent community. And when you start looking at COVID-19, one of the fascinating things with this is it starts showing just how impermanent some of the populations are. And obviously tourists are one of those populations, but there are a number of other populations which are significant as well. Many locations, their economies are dependent on short-term populations. And so one of the things I, you know, I'd like to see more of in terms of research uh, is using what I would call real population figures. So not just the permanent populations, but also bringing in those temporary populations to better understand regional dynamics um, and also the um, stresses this puts on resources. And I think those uh, temporary populations are really important to trying to understand resilience and community. Concept which um, I use with a colleague of mine, Bailey Addy, um, is that of voluntary temporary populations. Why voluntary? Because the one thing that distinguishes forced migrants and refugees from tourists and others is that voluntary nature. Voluntary temporary populations and seasonal production and consumption is very much geared towards those populations. And you know, you recognize the examples yourself. Um, tourists, second homeowners, and I know we've got someone doing research on second homes, wonderful. Um, students, obviously students are a really interesting um, voluntary temporary population um, in terms of the effects of crises and their response. And, and the other thing to pick up on, of course, is that these populations should not be seen in isolation, but they're very much interrelated with each other. And we've also got more production oriented temporary populations. Obvious one here is seasonal agricultural and poultry workers, but also um, short term workers in hospita hospitality and tourism, um, expats, commuting workers. And you then have this merger, which I find very interesting for thinking about tourism mobility of these categories. And often at times it's very hard to separate them. Um, and I mean, some of you may have had this experience, but in many cases, that production side, um, in terms of a temporary population, is, is, is tied up with, with consumption side and tourism. Um, seasonal workers in, in the tourism industry are a classic example of that. 
of this, no, working holidays, that, that sort of thing. And it then raises fundamental questions about, so what is resilient? Are we, if we think about resilience and tourism, yes, the region's important, but the region's clearly also um, often dependent on that voluntary mobile population. So what is the resilience of the population? And I think here in terms of resilience, we need to distinguish between how we understand place perspectives versus un how we understand the perspective of those populations. And how are they connected? Because the definitions of resilience are arguably gonna be different because of that um, particular sit no, sit situational perspective, I suppose we can think about it, in that the mobile populations, their resilience may well be um, termed in terms of their capacity to shift to other locations, which is going to be quite different from um, the, fi the fixity of place and the considerations that has for regional resilience. So how does that come together? And if we think of, of tourists, for example, and, I, and I, I've got this here, I'm not, I'm not ever quite convinced myself, but yeah, if we're thinking about mobile populations that are resilient, arguably the holiday tourists, leisure tourists, are the most resilient potentially in terms of capacity destination. Second homeowners less so because they've invested their capital in a particular location, which is therefore much harder to shift. But possibly, possibly, their place attachment may become important in terms of linking them back to where the second home is. Students obviously also have a degree of flexibility. You may want to go to one institution or, or to another. I often joke in, in my classes that these days I can tell no difference between university advertising and tourism destination advertising because they all have blue skies, smiling, happy people, couples holding hands, same kind of thing. But in one sense, it shouldn't be surprising because we're dealing with the attraction of temporary mobile populations. And from a place perspective, it is that attraction which is gonna be a part of their economic viability. And also I think what's significant with some of those populations is that students, second homeowners, they're temporary mobile populations, but they even attract more mobility by virtue of being somewhere for an extended period of time. In the case of the production side, of course, then, um, you know, is resilience going to be framed in terms of the capacity to shift elsewhere or continued commitment to that location? Clearly, in a number of locations, and even before COVID-19, you could think of, look, at, look at the UK and their agricultural sector and Brexit, um, there's a clear issue there in terms of linking production with the mobile population that usually assists in that production. Hospitality in many locations at the high season is no difference. Um, I've had the experience of being in Scotland on a um, trip several years ago, and when going into hotel, you know, staying in hotels and bed and breakfasts, uh, there were often very few Scottish people serving you. It was, ten, it was people from um, um, Eastern Europe in particular. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that at all. I'm not saying that. But it says something about the importance of those seasonal populations. And it strikes me that understanding that becomes really important in terms of place resilience. But it means that in terms of place and the movement of people, we need to be able to understand the interconnectivity between them all. Um, where, do, where does the voluntary population stop and why? How important is place attachment? How long do they stop for? Because they are questions which are, are integral to um, the, the well-being of the region. What about mobility between multiple place locations? And seasonal workers fit into that, ca into that category. In the case of Australia and New Zealand, for example, 
um, there are specific visas um, outside of post COVID-19 times, but there are now being a target actually of the post COVID-19 response to bring workers from the Pacific Islands into Australia and New Zealand as part of the so-called travel bubbles to be able to help in harvests. And there's, there's European examples of that as well. Again, that voluntary mobile population questioning its own resilience and how it's going to displace resilience. And I think it also raises issues about change. Because we have issues of place commitment, institutional arrangements and cost and wage levels in terms of being factors that will um, continue to attract those mobile populations. And we have real issues for many locations in terms of issues of fixity. And the big issue of, of having all that capital invested, whether it be tourism or, or in other areas, in which you cannot attract or allow in those mobile populations. And for many regions economy, that is critical. And it's not just tourists, obviously, as leisure travelers, but it's also the importance of short-term visitors and working people on working holidays and the capacity for that to occur. So what's the implications of thinking about that mobility in place? Obviously, I want to try and emphasize the significance of those populations, but also think about well, what makes those mobile populations resilience. Thinking about the, the reality of the fluidity of permanence, so-called permanence and mobility, because it then brings us back into where I started off in thinking about change. What's the role of place ties and attachment? To me, that's fundamental in terms of any regional response from a tourism, um, temporary population perspective. Arguably, those voluntary populations are becoming more important, not less important, even with COVID-19. And I think also it raises this whole issue that the construction of tourism, you cannot separate from the capacity to move and, and from mobility. We can only understand tourism if you, under, if you also understand mobility. And unfortunately, I think many policymakers and governments do not understand that. So to conclude, I think any consideration of resilience and sustainability in terms of regions and tourism and transitions, you must be able to incorporate multiple scales of analysis as well as notions of mobility. For me, this is the really sexy stuff. This is the, the methodologically and conceptually interesting stuff. How does change move up or down? Why doesn't it? Um, why does change move in and transitions move in some direction? directions and go in some trajectories and not others. A lot of this to me comes back to structure agency debate, fundamental to any good understanding of the social sciences, but which is missing, I think, from a lot of the um, business literature. Um, if I'm thinking of resilience myself, because I've often asked this, a resilient destination or region is one that has appropriate institutions and structures in place which are tied into the well-being of inhabitants. Um, and tourism is being used as a means, a means to that success rather than being an objective in its own right. I think it's extremely important in terms of the metrics which are then being used. But I'm coming at that from a particular perspective. If you ask someone in terms of their positionality, particularly from the tourism industry, they may have a completely different perspective. I think the term sustainable Tourism is a bit of a misnomer. We use it as shorthand. We're almost lazy when we use it. Um, because tourism's contribution to sustainability, I think, depends on um, distance you travel and speed of travel. Because so much of the, the effects are from um, the transport component. And it isn't so much how often you travel. And so you can, you can conceive of, and with you know, colleagues like Stephen Gosling and Dan Scott, we've been arguing this, you can conceive of 
the same amount of tourist trips, but if you're not going so far or so fast, your impact is much, much less. And arguably COVID-19 potentially does represent an opportunity to relocalize tourism. But as I touched on before, it depends on practices. It depends how long constraints are in. It depends on learning. But the problem we have in terms of transformation is that um, that relocalization is very much at odds with how tourism has been socially constructed. You really need massive institutional change to, to try and assist relocalization. You've got the introduction of non pharmaceutical interventions like social distancing and border controls. In one sense, it's not particularly new. You've got to return to what travel was like in the 60s and, and 70s in uh, requiring um, showing you've had an inoculation to go to some uh, low destinations and all come back. It's nothing particularly new. Um, and I've, as I've got here, I think COVID-19 itself, I'm pretty sure just become part of the, the issue attention cycle, which any crisis event goes through. After a while, I won't say people will forget about it necessarily, but it will not be so significant. COVID-19 almost certainly will become a background disease. I'm not saying the response is not inappropriate. Do not get me wrong, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying in the longer term, it will become a background disease. And as a result, it becomes part of the general pattern of travel. Just like many other diseases, which actually have even more of an impact globally than what does COVID-19 do, even now. What we are seeing is a lot of research opportunism, uh, a lot of current work coming out on, in a tourism context, I do not think is particularly uh, good. I've been in trouble for saying that, but that's what I think. Um, I think there's lots of noises in terms of tourism and other areas of saying, we need to reconfigure how we do research. No, we don't, we just need good research. We need um, longitudinal research, we need multiple scale research, but we don't need to change, I don't think change fundamentals. In terms of the future though, what's it gonna look like? Well, if you're gonna ask me, I think we're not gonna get massive transformation. We may have a slight change in trajectory, but I don't think it's gonna be so massive. Certainly not at a global scale. We're already starting to see a race to the bottom by some destinations in terms of their strategies having a focus on numbers and measuring competitiveness success in terms of the numbers of tourists you attract. That is, has been the case in tourism for ages. You can have all the discussion about sustainable tourism you want, but organizations like the UNWTO and others still focus on numbers. And unless you can shift that, well, we're really stuffed, to use a scientific term. We've got real problems. And I'm not sure that that shift is gonna necessarily move enough. There are some locations which are gonna rethink this, for sure, I fully, fully get that, but many will not. And that then becomes a really interesting competition between places and how it ties in with politics and perceptions of politicians and how that is relayed to the voting public of those places where you can vote. What will be the effect of that? Because if you if you are in a tourism destination organization and a destination over there says they've had X percent increase and you haven't, are you going to be able to resist not going down the numbers path? I think that'll be a really hard challenge. And I also think that given um, the impacts of COVID-19 on the economy, which have been exacerbated, I would argue, by austerity measures in so many countries, you are going to get acts of gross political desperation in many countries when politicians can to encourage mobility. 
you also have a fundamental other problem as well. There's lots of discussion about many planes not flying at the moment or for that matter. When you have idle capital that has no other use, how will it be used? That infrastructure is already there. So even if the business goes bankrupt, what then happens is that someone can come in and buy it up cheaply and run it at lower cost, which they may well be able to do as well because they can drive uh, in many places labor costs down as well because you've got so many unemployed. Usually such capital will not be retired until the costs of running it are, are high enough. But for example, how many governments are going to be brave enough to bring in carbon taxes at the moment? How many governments are actually brave enough in terms of their bailout for aviation sector to also put in green conditions on it? Most of them aren't. And because you've got that potential in terms of a really strong negative rebound effect from COVID-19, I'm really not convinced you're going to get massive transformation. What I do think we have, though, in many ways, is a, is a trial run in terms of the implications of global environmental change and global heating. And that raises real issues in terms of how well we can respond, especially when we've seen multilateral measures with respect to international and global health really put under pressure by COVID-19 because the non-participation in particular countries. And in many ways, I think what we're seeing therefore is what could also happen between that, that, that real tension between multilateral thinking what we really need versus bilateral or, or unilateral approaches. And obviously that's at a national level, but again, that will flow through down to regions and up. And how do we respond to that? I think is a real challenge in terms of regions, transitions, tourism, and COVID-19. Thank you very much.